in talking over together these questions, we are sharing not only with the question, but also with the answers, with the exploration of the answer. So it's not just I answer and you listen and we all agree or disagree, but together we're trying to find the right answer to these questions. I'm not asking how fear arises. That you have already explained. Rather, what is the actual substance of fear? What is fear itself? Is it a pattern of physiologic reactions and sensations, tightening of muscles, surge of adrenaline, and so forth? Or is something more? What, what am I to look at when I look at fear itself? Can this looking take place when fear is not immediately present? I am not asking how fear arises, that you have already explained. Rather, what is the actual substance of fear? What is, the, what is fear itself? Is it a pattern of physiologic reactions and sensations, tightening of muscles, surge of adrenaline, and so forth, or is something more? What am I to look at when I look at fear itself? Can this looking take place when fear is not immediately present? Rather long question. Let's the question as far as I can make out from this question wants to know what is the substance of fear, what is actual fear, and what is how can one observe fear? present or past? Right? That's the question. Do we understand the question? What is fear itself? Apart from the physiologic reactions, the tightening and so on, what is the actual moment of fear? What is the nature, the inward structure of fear, substance? I can go on with that. We all, we all understood the rather long question. What is fear itself? We are generally afraid of something. Right? Or a remembrance of something that has happened. Or a projection of the reaction into the future. Right? But that is not what the questioner asks only. He asks also what is actual nature of fear? I really don't know, we won't find out. <laughs> when one is afraid, both physiologically as well as psychologically, it is 
is it not? Something that one f has feeling of danger, right? feeling of total isolation, all loneliness, deep abiding, lasting loneliness. Those are all reactions to something. I'm afraid of this. One is afraid of the snake, or what one, one has had pain, and is afraid of that pain, and so on. So it is either a remembrance, and therefore something that has happened in the past, and recalled when that when a dangerous moment arrives, the remembrance of the past, identifying and say that is fear. The questioner says, and I think there is <coughs> something which we have to go into it together, which is, apart from all this physical, psychological reactions, which we know as fear, apart from it, is there fear in itself, not fear of something? You want to say, am I uh, making it? Is there fear per se? Or we only know fear in relation to something else. If it is not relation to something else, is it fear? We only know fear in relation to something, from something or towards something. But if you eliminate all that, is there actual fear? which you can examine. You, you understand my question? Or is fear, deep-rooted fear, in the mind, which has always wanted total security and not finding it, it's afraid. You understand? Please, we're examining it together. You're not just playing games with me. It's not, the ball is not in your court or in my court. <laughs> we're looking at it together. The mind, the brain, needs complete security to function well, healthily, sanely. Not finding it in anything, in a relationship, in an idea, in a belief, in an image, An intelligent mind rejects all that. But yet it must have complete security. In, and lacking that is fear comes into being, right? That is, is there something totally, completely secure? Not the certainty of belief, dogma, rituals, and ideas, which can be abolished and new ideas, dogmas, theories can be replaced by them. But if we put aside all that, is the mind, the brain, seeking 
a security that is imperishable. You, and not finding it, it, it has deep-rooted fear. I don't know we meeting together. So I'm asking, my, one is asking oneself, apart from the ordinary kind of fears, is the mind brain creating the fear itself? You follow? Because it has no, there's nothing valid, nothing that is whole. And is that the substance of fear? That is, can the brain, and the brain includes, mind includes the brain reactions and all that, can that total mind have complete security, certainty, not about something, you understand what I mean? Not about God, belief or that, but in itself completely who? I, you, am I conveying something? Let's see, can the mind in itself have no fear. Am I, am I conveying something? Are we meeting some, each other? Mind, thought, which is part of the mind and brain, has created, <laughs> desire and security has created various illusions, philosophical uh, and so on theological, and not finding it there, it either creates something beyond itself in which it can find security, total security, or the mind is so totally complete, it has no need for fear. You, I would mean, are we? Um, this is rather difficult. We are not talking about getting rid of fear, or suppressing fear, or the cause of fear. Or we went into all that the other day. But we are asking something totally different. Which is, can the mind in itself have no cause or substance or reaction which, is, which brings fear? You, are we? So please, this rather difficult question to or uh, to find this out, that is, can the mind have, can it ever have <laughs> can it ever be in a state again that word state me imply static, I don't mean that. Can it ever be in a, in a quality, in a state, where it has no movement reaching out or going, you follow? Completely whole in itself. I wonder if I'm You see, this implies 
going in, well, understanding what is meditation, if you are interested in it. Meditation isn't all this nonsense that's going on, but to be free from the from fear, you follow? Both physiological as well as psychological. Be free from it. Otherwise you don't one can't love, one can't there is no love, there is no compassion, there is you know. As long as there's fear the other cannot exist. And to and to meditate. Not to read something, to understand the, the nature of fear and to go beyond it, which is to find out whether the mind has no, please this may I, has no memory or remembrance of something which has caused fear, you, so that it is completely whole. I think I will more or less answer that question. Oh yes, see, can this looking take place when fear is not immediately present? One can recall fear, can't one? And the recalling of that fear can be observed, can't it? You are sitting here quietly, probably you have no fear now. But you have had fear in the past and you can say, well, you can summon it. But it's not actually the same, right? Because at the moment when there is no <coughs> fear exists a moment after, not at the actual mo moment. I don't know if you you have given it a name, a reaction, and so on, and that you call it fear. But at the actual moment of great danger, moment of facing something that may cause fear, at that second there is no fear, you, there is nothing. Then there is a recollection of the past and then the naming of it and say, but Joe, I'm afraid, all the tightening of the muscles. <laughs> And and so on, so on. So one can, I think, recall the past fears and look at it. The ob observing of that fear is important because either you put it outside of you, or you say, "I am that fear." It's not you observing that fear; you are that entity that reaction. Then when there is no division as you and fear, but only state of that reaction, something, have you noticed it, something entirely new takes place. Right? Let's go into it. <coughs> when one sees in the world about us no demonstrable de universal principle of justice, I feel no compelling reason for cha to change myself or the chaotic society outside. I see no rational criteria by which to measure the consequences of action and their accountability. 
Can you share your perception on this matter with us? When one sees the world about us, no demonstrable... I don't like the word demonstrable. There is no... one cannot demonstrate universal principle of justice. I feel no compelling reason to change myself or the chaotic society outside. I see no rational criteria by which to measure the consequences of action and their ac accountability. Can you share your perception so on? Is there justice in the world? This has been a question of all the, for all the philosophers who have gone into this, spinning a lot of words about it. Now, is there justice in the world? rational, sane justice. You are clever, I am not. Right? You have money, I am not. You have capacity, and other has not. You have talent, you have... you can... you know, can enjoy all that. Other is born poor. One has crippling disease and the other has not. The criminal, what we call criminals, with their... and he judged and sent to prison or whatever takes place. So we consider that there must be justice. Right? Seeing all this, we say there must be somewhere justice. So, we move from lack of justice to an idea of justice. I don't know if you are following this. God is just. And so on. But the fact remains that there is terrible injustice in the world. Right? And the questioner wants to know if there is no justice, why should I change? You say, there is no point in it. Why should I change this chaotic world? where the dictators are so supreme, they, they, their very life is injustice, hmm? terrorizing over millions of people, and seeing all that, there is no rational cause for me to change. I think that that's a rather not rational question, if I may say so. Do you change because for some cause, because you are under pressure? Or you are rewarded if I it is change brought about by reward and punishment or you see human beings are so irrational right through the world and all the things they have made is also irrational, and you as a human being, you as a human, is the rest of humanity. I don't know if you see that. 
right? As we went into it the other day. And if you are the rest of mankind, it, you, you must, you are responsible. Not because you find you are rewarded or you see so much injustice in the world, how the crooks get away with everything. <laughs> they build marvelous churches and all that, a lot of money, huh? and there are millions and millions and millions starving. So, change is not brought about through compulsion, through reward or punishment. The mind itself sees the absurdity of all this and says, I will, you follow? It has, it's per se, it sees the necessity of changing itself. Not because you tell me to change, or God or the priest or somebody tells me to change. I see the chaos around me, and that chaos has been created by human beings, and I am, I am that human being, and I have to act. It's my responsibility, a global responsibility. Can we die psychologically to the self? To find out is a process of choiceless awareness. I wish you wouldn't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> However, in order to observe choicelessly, it seems we must have ended or died to the ego, me. So my question is, how can I observe in my current state of fragmentation, is it like the eye trying to see the eye? As you have said, we must be free of fear in order to observe fear. This is an impossible paradox. It is driving me mad. <laughs> Please clearly clarify this issue. I will clarify the issue. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody. Because then you are, it's not yours. You are second hand, you become second hand human beings, which we are. <laughs> so, please, that's the first thing to do. Because that distorts our thinking, you understand? We are the result of million years of pressure of other people's thinking, propaganda, all that. And if one is not free of all that, you can never find out the origin of all things. I don't even So my question is, how can I observe in my current state of fragmentation? You cannot, right? But you can observe your fragmentation. I don't know if you follow this. I am observing myself. In observing, I discover that I am looking at myself with certain prejudice. So, I forget looking at myself, I go into the question of prejudice. Yeah? I am aware, I become aware of my prejudice, and can I look at it 
without any sense of distortion, without choice, without and all the rest of it. Just to observe the prejudice I have. Let the story of prejudice tell me. Not I tell the story about prejudice, but let prejudice unroll itself. You understand what I'm saying? What's the cause of prejudice? The image, conclusions, opinions. You know? So I begin to discover, one begins to discover, in looking at fear, I, re I realize that I am fragmented, that fragmentation is brought about by thought, naturally. And therefore, I begin to uh, be aware of the movement of thought. So it's my, it is, what is important is not observe fear. When my mind itself is clouded, confused, so I inquire into my confusion. Why, why, are, why are human beings confused? Well, why are you all confused? If you are very clear, you won't be here. And I wouldn't be here, <laughs> thank God. Because we are confused, our question is, what is this confusion? Who, who has created this confusion? in us and outside of us, right? So in inquiring or observing confusion, I begin, the movement is to be aware of the movement of thought, the contradictory, contradictory nature of thought. And that, you follow? I am let, the whole thing unrolls itself if you if you watch. The story is there, but we don't read the story. We are telling the the book what it should what it should say. You understand? Know, so we are not saying it's. The, there is the history of myself. Hmm? History of mankind is myself. So, in inquiring into reading that book, I read the book, chapter by chapter, or I understand the whole book instantly. <laughs> you, that more. That, all, that, that implies one has to have a deep insight. I don't want to enter into all that. I don't know if you want me to go on into that. So look, ah. there is confusion in all of us. And it, it would say, I'm not confused, that would be too silly. Or, I have perfect relationship with another, that is equally silly. So, I'm, one is confused. Now, either you analyze it, the cause of it, you understand? Please follow this a little bit the cause of it, which is thought, thought in its very nature, contradictory, thought in its movement is divisive, as a natural, or divisive, thought in itself must be limited, because it's based on knowledge, and knowledge can never be complete, never, right? So, that's the way we go into 
analytically or let thought move in a particular direction to examine, which means the remembrance, the memory, the experience is observing, right? You follow all this? No? All right. When you observe somebody, your friend or whoever it is, you are observing what? Not the face, not the figure, not how she looks or he looks, long hair, short hair. You are observing the image that you have built about her or him. So we are saying all that is a movement of thought. based on remembrances, right, conclusions, ideas, all that's a movement of thought. I mean, this is obvious fact. You don't have to prove it to anybody. That thought in itself is divisive, fragmentary, uh, partial, can never be complete. Therefore, it must create confusion. Now, I've explained it. Now, can you look at this se sense of confusion in oneself? Please follow this a little bit. Without going through all that process, you understand? Without explanation, without remember, just to look at it and see, to have an insight into it, then you can explain. Do you have a I Have I explained? I'll get it, I'll get it. Have I explained this? Insight, by the, the very word, means to have sight in the thing insight. But you cannot have insight if it is merely the response of memory. Look, sir. Organized religion hmm, is not religion, right? With all the nonsense that goes on with it. Rituals, dogmas, theories, theolo theologians spinning out new theories about so on, so on, so on, so on. That's not religion. Now, what makes you say that's not religion? Is it merely a, a thoughtful examination of all the religions? There dogmas, their superstitions, their ignorance, their rituals, and, and saying at the end of it, this is nonsense. Hmm? Or you see immediately that any form of propaganda, pressure, and so on, that they never a religion. You see, either you see it immediately, and therefore you're out of it. I don't know. But if you are merely <coughs> examining various religions and then coming to a conclusion, then that conclusion will be limited, can be broken down by argument, by superior knowledge, and so on. But if you get an insight into the nature of this religious structure which man has invented, the mind is immediately free of it. I don't know if you're following me. It's like, I'll take another 
If you understand the tyranny of one guru, right? Tyranny. They are tyr tyrants. Because they, are, they want power, position, all the rest of it. They know, we don't know, others don't know. So, the tyranny, if you see the tyranny of the guru, of one guru, you have seen the tyranny of all gurus. You understand? So you don't go from one guru to another. I'm afraid you're doing that. <laughs> in observing, uh, in observation without the observer, is there a transformation from staying with the fact that leads to, to an increase of attention? Does the energy created have a direction? Good Lord, I don't know what's all this. <laughs> what is the relationship of attention to thought, to the center, the self? Is there a gap between attention and thought that leads to freedom? Look, so these questions, unfortunately, don't relate to your actual life, right? I'm not saying you should not put these questions, but I'm only asking you, if you most respectfully, all these questions actually have not touched the living daily life, you understand? Right? Is that so or not? So you have all these become all these questions become theoretic. Something abstract, something that you have heard and then say, well, who is the observer and the observer is the observer and so on. <laughs> but if we say, look, my life is this. Let us let's find out why I live this way. You know something? Why I'm worried, why I'm, my mind is eternally chattering, why I have no right relationship with another, why am I cruel, why, you, you understand? Why is my mind so narrow. Why am I neurotic? Neurotic person never says I'm neurotic. But one can observe the person who is neurotic. Maybe my wife or my husband who is neurotic. But we never apparently deal with questions that affect our daily existence. I wonder why. You understand my question? All these questions are that. There are, I think there are about 250 questions. We went through them. Please, I'm not scolding or impatient or preaching. But I'm just asking myself, I ask, after reading all those questions, I say, why, why isn't there one question that affects psychologically the inward, you understand? Why am I unhappy? Why am I in conflict with my neighbor, with my husband, with my... You follow? So why is this happening? I'll, I'll answer these questions, if I must. But why are, we, why are we so timid or so enclosed 
or we are afraid to expose ourselves to another, which doesn't mean that you must expose. If we ask really a genuine a question that affects deeply our life, it has much more vitality than this. Right? So, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Why do we, each one of us, live the way we are doing? Taking drugs, pot, drinking, smoking, pursuing pleasure and aggression. Why? You understand? Why? Why are we like this? Please uh, go into it with me. Why are we aggressive? The whole society in which we live, in this society of the West, aggression is one of the most important things. And competition, they both go together. Why? You can see in the animals how aggressive they are in mating in certain season. They don't compete, do they? I you know, when a lion has killed a zebra, other lions share it. You've seen it in television and so on. But apparently with us, aggression is the most deep-rooted thing. Mm -hmm. And competition. Why are we like this? Is it the fault of the society? Our education? But ours, the society is what we have made of it. So don't say society, blame the society for this, or some education, but apparently we are deeply aggressive and competitive. And if you are not competitive, if you are not aggressive, you, in this society you are trodden down, right? You are discarded, you look down upon. Why are we aggressive? Go on, sir, examine it. Is it that this emphasis on individual freedom, you understand? Individual freedom, and that freedom demands that he must express himself at any cost. Is that it? Especially in this country, in the West, this sense of Freedom, you know. If you have um, an instinct to do something, if you want to do something, do it. Don't restrain. Don't examine it. It doesn't matter. You must, if you have this feeling, act. I'll go into it. I don't bother. But they look different. 
either you write the questions and answer them or let me talk a little about this. You can see what aggression does, right? You are aggressive, I'm aggressive for the same job, for the same this, that, the other. And so we are fighting each other all along the way, right? Both psychologically and physically. And we carry on. That's part of a pattern, part of our social education. And to break that pattern, hmm, we said we must exercise our will. Right? Which is a, another ex aggression. I don't know if you follow this. Right? Right? I'm following this. Huh? When I exercise my will, will is another form of I must. You understand? That's another form of aggression. So can you have any insight um, right, into this, into aggression? You've understood my question? Or is it too difficult? Huh? You understand my question, sir? That is, I am aggressive. Thank God I'm not, I've never been, I don't want to be. I suppose I'm aggressive. And uh, that's the pattern from childhood, that's the education, the mother, the father, and the society, the boys around me. Hmm? All aggressive. And I see, and I like that. It gives me pleasure. And I accept it, and I also become aggressive. Right? And I, then as I grow up, somebody shows me the nature of aggression, what it does in society, how competition is destroying human beings. It is not only the speaker is saying this, scientists are beginning to say this. So perhaps you will accept the scientists. So, you explain it very carefully, all the reason, the cause, and the destructive nature of competition, which is to compare, always comparing. You understand? Now a mind that doesn't compare at all, you understand? is a totally different kind of mind. It has got much more vitality. So one explains all this, and yet we go on. <laughs> Being aggressive, competitive, comparing ourselves with somebody, always something much greater, not with the poorer but always something greater. So there is this pattern established, this curve, this framework, and in which the mind is caught. And listening to it, you say, I must get out of it. I must do something about it. Which is what? Another form of aggression, you understand? I wonder if you see that. So can you can we have an insight into aggression? You follow? Not explanations, not the remembrance of all the implications of it, and so on, and so on, which is constant examination, then coming to a conclusion, and acting according to that conclusion. That's not insight. Where if you have immediate insight into it, you understand? 
then you have broken the whole pattern of, of aggression. That is, uh, okay. we compare, don't we? Both physically, you have long, I'm, I wish you, had, you could look, I could look as nice as you look. Or psychologically, we say, so, so there's constant comparison. Which means what? I don't know if you've gone into this. To compare oneself with somebody else, greater, more intelligent, bright and so on, is to what? Deny what you are and change what you are. I wonder if you understand this. Is it, am I making this clear? I, look, I compare myself with you, and I say you're awfully clever, awfully, <coughs> all that. <coughs> and in that comparison, I say, but Joe, I realize I'm very dull. Right? You following this? But if I have no comparison, am I dull? I, I begin then to discover my, the things as is. So, what shall we do with the way we are living? So to bring it home. What shall we do? You will attend meetings, other forms of other me kinds of meetings, discussions, philosophers explaining their philosophy, the latest psychologists, non-Freudian, non-this and non-that, but the latest, he'll explain to you. You understand? We go, we are doing this all the time, from moving from one thing to another. And that's called an open mind. <laughs> but we never say, look, this is so, I am like this, let me find out. Why am I like this? Why, why I have wounds, psychological bruises? You understand? Why? Why do I live with them? I don't feel following all this. But reading somebody like books of or attending. Oh, Krishnamurti's talks, and then quoting back, which was so, hmm? I know all this by heart. <laughs> <laughs> I have been at this for 60 years and more, so you don't have to quote to me. But if you don't quote and find out for yourself, you understand, sir? It has much more, f there is greater energy, more fun, more Allah. You become much more alive. What is the relationship of attention to thought? Is there a gap between attention and thought? Right? The this is a good question because it affects us. That is, what is attention? What is the relationship of thought to attention? Is there inattention freedom? You, right? Is this a question that affects us? That is, we know what concentration is, right? Most of us do, from childhood, 
we are trained to concentrate. And the implications of that concentration is narrowing down all energy to a particular point and holding to that point. Right? Boy in a school is looking out of the window, looking at all the birds and the trees and the movement of the leaves or the squirrel climbing up the tree. And the educator says, Look, we are not paying attention. Concentrate on the book. Right? Listen to what I'm saying and so on, so on. Which is what? Go into itself, which is what? You are making concentration far more important than attention. That is, if the boy is looking out of the window, watching that squirrel, I would help him to watch, if I'm the educator, I would help him to watch that squirrel completely, you follow? Watch it. Watch the movement of the tail, the mouth, the nozzle, how his claws are, everything, watch it. Then if he learns to watch that attentively, he'll pay attention to the beastly book. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? So there is no contradiction. So, attention is a state of mind in which there is no contradiction, right? There is no entity or a center or a point which says, I must attend. In that state there is no, there is no vestige of energy. Whereas in concentration there is always the controlling process going on. I must, I want to concentrate on, on that page, but thought wanders off. And then you pull it, pull it back. You saw the constant battle going on. Whereas in attention, if you go into it, it's very simple really, when you, when somebody says, I love you, hmm, and he means it, you're attending. You don't say, oh, you love me, do you love me because I, have, I look nice, or I have money, or I have sexual, or this or that. You follow what I'm saying? So, attention is something totally different from concentration. And this attention, the question asks, what is the relationship of this attention to thought? Right? None, obviously. I don't know if you follow this. Concentration has a relationship to thought, because thought directs, I must learn, I must uh, concentrate in order to control myself, right? Thought then gives a direction from one point to another point, whereas in attention, in attention, Thought has no place, you are dead. And is there a gap between attention and thought? So, as we explained the other day, if you once understand, if one once has a grasp of the whole movement of thought, you won't put this question. You understand, sir? I'm not, I'll answer it, but first one has to understand what thought is, you understand? Not somebody telling you what thought is. 
but to find, to, to see what thought is, how it comes into being. I'll, if you will go here, yeah, I'll do it again, we'll go into it. There can be no thought if there is total amnesia, right? But unfortunately, or fortunately, we are not in a state of amnesia. And uh, one wants to find out what thought is, what place it has in life. You understand? So one begins to examine, think. Right? So what is thinking? Thinking takes place as a reaction to memory, obviously. Memory responds to a challenge, to a question, to an action, or responds in relationship to something or to an idea, to a person, right? You see all this in life. So what is thinking? What is thought? How does thought exist in human mind? So one says, one asks then, what is memory? You understand? What is memory? Memory is you have uh, you have trodden on some insect that has bitten you. That memory, that pain, is registered and stored in the brain. That pain, which becomes a memory, it's not actual pain. That pain is over, but the memory remains. So, next time you're careful. So there is experience as pain, which has become knowledge, and that knowledge, experience, is memory. That memory responds as thought, right? That memory is thought. And knowledge, however wide, however deep, however extensive, must always be limited, right? There is no complete knowledge. I don't know if you're following this. So, thought is always partial, limited, divisive, because it's in itself it isn't complete. In itself it can never be complete. It can think about completeness. You understand? It can think about totality, whole, but it's not, thought itself is not whole. So whatever it creates philosophically, religiously, is not, is still partial, limited, fragmentary. Because knowledge is part of ignorance. You understand, sir? I don't know if you understand this. As knowledge can never be complete, it must always go hand in hand with ignorance. Right? That's logical, rational. And if one understands the nature of thought, and understand the nature of what concentration is, then attention has, n ha thought cannot attain, because attention is giving all your energy to, you understand, without any restraint. I wonder if you understand this. If you are listening now, I hope you are, if you are listening and attending, what takes place? There is no you attending, right? 
There is no center that says, I must attend. You are attending. Because you are, it's your life, you are, you are interest. If you're not interested, lying down uh, in the sun and say, well, I'll listen to it. It's a different matter. But if you're serious and giving attention, you will soon find out the, all your problems, all that's gone, at least for the moment. So, to resolve problems is to attend. I wonder if you got, could, you understand this? It's not a trick. I'm so sorry, 70 minutes to one. So, sir, another question of the same kind. So, this, as this is the last question and answer meeting. We should perhaps some of us meet again Saturday and Sunday, and after that we we'll close the shop. <laughs> All these questions, 250 questions of them and more, is always somehow not dealing with the facts of oneself, you understand? Sir? Why is my mind chattering, so restless? You follow? You don't ask such a question. Have you ever asked that question to yourself? Why are you so restless, especially in this country? The mind so chattering, restless, moving, you're going from one thing to another. Constant entertainment. Right? Why is your mind chattering? And what will you do about it? Right? Your immediate response, if you are, is to control it, right? There must not chatter. Which means what? The very controller is chattering. I don't know if you fall, see that. Do you see that? The controller who says, I mustn't chatter, is in itself part of chattering. I see, see, see the beauty of it? So what will you do? Answer. If you, if you look, if you observe it, if you say, look, my mind is chattering. And I can examine the causes of chattering. Because chattering is part of the mind being occupied. Right? I don't know if you have noticed. The mind, the whole structured brain, must be occupied with something. Right? With sex, with problems, with television, with going football, going to church. It must be occupied. Right? Why? Why must it be occupied? If it is not occupied, aren't you rather uncertain? Don't you fear not being occupied? You follow it? You feel empty. Hmm? Don't you? No? You feel lost. You feel 
then you begin to realize what you are, that there is tremendous loneliness inside. Right? And so, to avoid that deep loneliness, with all its agony, the mind had occupied about everything else except that. And then that becomes the occupation. You follow? If I'm not occupied with all the outward things like cooking, washing, washing up, cleaning the house, and so on, then it says, I'm lonely, that's my concern. You follow? How am I to get over it? Let me talk about it. Uh, how miserable I am. Uh, back to chat. But if you say, what is, why is the mind chattering? Ask the question, so go on with me. Why is your mind chattering? Never a moment it is quiet. You understand? Never a moment when there is complete freedom from any problem. So, again, is that occupation the result of our education, of the social nature of our life? Those are all excuses, obviously. But when one says, my, when one realizes, if one does, your mind is chattering. And look at it, you follow? Wait with it, stay with it. I don't need to explain it. My mind is chattering. All right, I watch it. I say, all right, chatter. <laughs> I'm, I'm attending to it. You follow? I wonder if you understand this. I'm attending, which means I'm not trying to, not to chatter. I'm not saying I must not suppress it or any of that. I'm just attending to chatter. If you do, you will see what happens. Then your mind is so clear, free of all this. And probably that's the state of normal, healthy human being. Right? That's enough, I think. 